we'll just get right into this. I don't think I need to introduce the panel. Uh, we had the same group together last year and had a great discussion, um, free-flowing discussion that I think was very informative for everybody. And this year we were going to try to solve all the country's problems, but since we have about 55 minutes, we're going to focus on real estate uh, to begin with. And as we sat here last year, I think everybody was surprised, and we went down and we added up all the capital that people had to invest. And I think there was somewhere around 12 to 14 billion dollars represented on the panel here um, at a time when people said, well, wait a minute, there's you know, lack of liquidity. And clearly we demonstrated there's pl plenty of equity just sitting right here. So I think the big question to maybe start with, and we can just go right down maybe starting with Bill, what have you guys done in the last year and how much um, have you been able to invest in this environment? Uh, since the summer of 2010, we've invested or put to work about a billion and a half of equity in 22, 23 deals, uh, mostly in the Northeast quarter, Boston, New York, Washington, and the West Coast. Um, over the last, I guess it's really calendar year 2011, we've put out $7 billion of equity. It's been around the globe. Uh, the U.S., Europe, and uh, Asia as well. In the last 12 months, we've put out about uh, $3.5 billion worth of uh, real estate transactions on a value basis, about a billion and a half of equity, and that billion and a half is split about uh, half a billion in the U.S. and about a billion outside the U.S., and most of those transactions really were in the second half of 2010 through the first quarter of 2011, um, activity is uh, slowing on the acquisition side in the last uh, six months in 2011. And I'm sure we'll get into why things have slowed in the, in the last six months in 2011 on the acquisition side in a little while. At TPG, across the broader private equity platform, uh, including non-real estate related investments, we've invested about $6 billion over the last 12 months, again, globally, not unlike uh, John's profile. With regard to real estate specifically, I've invested about a billion dollars during that same time period in a couple larger corporate style transactions like our Taylor Morrison Monarch Homes acquisition. Um, and, and then across a host of smaller, uh, small balance, uh, both commercial and residential MPL portfolios, primarily in, in the United States. We've uh, invested about a billion and a half uh, uh, during this same period we've been talking about since, you know, late 2010. Almost all of it in Walton, some of it a uh, small part of, relatively speaking, in uh, casinos uh, outside of Walton um, and um, you know it's been a pretty good time to invest over the last uh, uh, year or two and um, we'll see what happens going forward. I think if those of you added that up it's close to 13 billion dollars of equity invested um, since we were up here last time. I think that's a pretty active market um, by anybody's um, imagination and probably much more so than people would have thought um, looking back a year ago. And the great thing is, I think the shortest I've worked with the guys up here is 20 years, some going to 30 years, so I know everybody pretty well. And these guys have been at it over many cycles. You know, Neil, as you look at what you did and the transactions you were able to do over the last year, how does it stack up? going back to the early 80s, the 90s, you know, do you feel better about your transactions this year than you have in the past? Well, you know, it doesn't take a genius to say that the best time to invest is at the bottom of a market. So obviously this is a heck of a lot better in retrospect than investing in 05 or 06 or 07. Uh, the interesting question, I suppose, is, is this going to be as good as it was in the early 90s when the real estate market crashed? Uh, time will, only time will tell. The conditions are somewhat different now. In the early 90s when the market crashed, uh, commercial real estate was the cause of that crash, really. I'm talking about the whole economy. Um, and um, K 
cap rates were roughly what they are now, uh, but uh, the 10-year bond was around 9%, 8 9%. Stock market was uh, much uh, cheaper, uh, cheaper. So real estate was mispriced. Also, there was a tremendous amount of uh, new construction. Uh, this time, there wasn't as much new construction at all, other than in the for sale housing, as you know. And at the same time, uh, um, every asset was over leveraged, so to speak, not just commercial real estate. So the capital markets this time uh, have uh, recovered much quicker than they did uh, back in 1990, in the 90s. On the other hand, they had a much greater supply of new construction coming on during the recession. You looked out of your window, there was a crane on every corner, and now uh, we're in a situation where you don't have nearly, you don't have much new competition coming on in terms of construction, but you do have uh, the capital market stronger, so pricing is more aggressive. So it'll take some time to look back, but I think uh, in, in summary, um, you know, the investing in 2010 and 11 was a very good time to invest. Calvin? Well, John and I had the pleasure of working together in, in 92 and 93. I, I think in retrospect, um, that will prove to have been a much easier time, candidly, to invest than this time. Uh, that will look much more like a traditional business cycle in my mind, where there were certain excesses that needed to be wrung out of the economy. And when they did, you had a fairly a robust recovery, which, which many of us in the room had a chance to experience. <clears throat> As Neil said, uh, it was really the commercial real estate markets that led that particular recession. I think in contrast, this last recession we've experienced is far more fundamental and has much more uh, rudimentary underpinnings. Obviously, it was, a, it was really much more about the housing market, which affects the, the vast majority of Americans in some way, unlike a, a distress in the commercial office building market, for instance. And, uh, and obviously now it's about jobs and, and a European contagion that is extremely fundamental. So the nature of this recovery, as we're all experiencing, is much more anemic. And I think the ability to predict the robustness of it is much more difficult. Uh, I certainly agree there's a, there's a robust set of opportunities we can all talk about. But I think the profile of what we've been through this time is much, much different. And the prognosis for recovery is much less clear. And it, I think an interesting thing, too, with all of these competitors, friends, experts up here, is everybody's taken a slightly different view on various transactions. And I know, John, at Blackstone, you guys have bought some huge portfolios um, of assets around the country with cash flow, and I think feel very good about them. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, thinking about Kelvin's comments, I agree that there are serious headwinds. All of us know that between Europe uh, the fiscal situation around the globe, the need for deleveraging. We clearly are in an environment of weak growth. I think most of us anticipate it'll take some time before that changes. But if you go back to the early 90s, what Neil was talking about, we were able to buy assets at big discounts to physical replacement costs. And I think those conditions exist today. So uh, we bought this year, the largest transaction we did was buy Centro 600 grocery anchored, primarily grocery anchored shopping centers in the US. It was a very complicated deal, over leveraged Australian parent company, but at its core, we bought shopping centers at $98 a square foot. And we bought them for a little bit north of an 8% cap rate, where we had seen uh, a decline in occupancy because the company was starved for capital, also because of the economic headwinds. And so when I step back, I say to myself, yes, it's a very scary macro environment. Yes, I can't believe a lot in the way of economic growth. But if I can buy hard assets at big discounts to physical replacement costs because of the distress that exists, because some asset or company is broken in some way, I think you're getting compensated for that. So I am maybe a little more optimistic about the investment environment, uh, not because I believe a lot in terms of economic prospects going forward, but because of the entry price for assets that are troubled today. And Bill, you've bought a number of very large assets uh, around the country, and I think even sold some of them. Yeah, uh, I would just first say I couldn't agree with Kelvin and John Moore. Uh, the, you know, the country faces fiscal problems at every level of government. We have a structural unemployment problem. We've got a housing problem. Uh, you sprinkle in some international issues, Europe, Middle East. Um, you know, it's a tough environment. So what we've tried to do is buy the highest quality assets we could in supply constrained markets with good demand underpinnings, liquid markets where you can get out. 
Um, you know, following that thesis, we bought in New York, uh, probably either indirectly meaning debt or directly meaning equity, 3,500, 4,000 hotel rooms, 900 hotel rooms in Boston, and then we bought um, half of two premier Park Avenue office properties here. And um, you know, we, where we have liquidated, uh, we have so, uh, sold at terrific prices. Uh, we had the good fortune of going in at good bases. Uh, but the ho hotels that we still own are way ahead of projections. And, um, you know, I, uh, following this thesis, we feel pretty good ab about our exits. I would also say that, I mean, the true test of how you're doing is how your investors feel you're doing. And in our 2007 vintage fund, after some pretty big missteps, primarily in Japan in late 07, uh, we put together the best portfolio we ever have, and uh, we've already returned 40% of the capital to investors and hope to be 50% by the end of the year, uh, into the first quarter next year. So happy investors. Um, I guess we can't talk about fundraising because many people are out fundraising. We're not allowed to do that nowadays. But looking forward maybe to 2012, um, do you think you'll be able to make as good of investments? Do you think the opportunities will be bigger, more needs for capital, or do you feel that 2010 and 2011 really will represent the better times of this cycle? You know, Paul or John, anybody chime in? Sure. I, I think, in really looking at it, I think you know clearly, in looking back, 2009, 2010 were were clearly great years to invest. I think. Coming into 2011, we started to really see a little disconnect where the capital market valuations were starting to run dramatically ahead of the fundamentals and pricing started getting a little high. Um, in some markets, we actually started to see deal pricing starting to approach 06 and 07 levels again. So I think we got a little concerned and pulled back on the pricing from uh, an acquisition standpoint in the last six months and we've really not been extremely active on the new business side here in the U.S., um, in the, as I said, in the last six months and 11. But the interesting thing is we're starting to, to see opportunities come around again, because I think from peak pricing, which was probably May or June of this year, uh, pricing in every one of the major supply-constrained markets, I would say, has pulled back 10 to 15 percent. So I think we're feeling a little more optimistic about opportunities coming into 2012. And I think with the the general concern as far as the global economy, what's happening with jobs here in the U.S., I think you're going to see pricing either continue to moderate or maybe pull back a little, which will create some good opportunities going to 2012. Uh, just adding to that, I, I'd say of the you know 40 or so deals we've done in the last 20 months, virtually every one of them was uh, driven by debt. Uh, either maturities, recaps, restructurings, and given uh, the horizon, maturing debt over the next, you know, one to three or four or five years, um, we believe that's going to be one of the most fertile areas to invest. Uh, you've got a massive gap between what things can are financed for today and what they can be refinanced for tomorrow. Do, do you agree that pricing sort of reached sort of maybe a little peak, a mini peak here over the summer and that it's pulled back and you know, if so, why? I mean, why did that? I mean, people have been sort of saying that, that prices have come down here in the fall. Is it justified? Were prices ahead of themselves? You know, what do you see happening in the fundamentals in your portfolios that may, may have caused people to pull back on pricing? I think, John, I think you've clearly seen examples in, in every one of the major markets, whether it be New York, D.C., Boston, where, you know, Six months ago, people were taking deals to the market and there'd be a whisper number by the broker and before they finished the process, you know, the deals would be on the contract at or maybe above the whisper number. And clearly in the last three or four months in every one of the markets, we've had deals that have come to the market and have been tied up and then were retraded and fallen out of bed. Pricing was adjusted downward. We've also seen deals that had started in the markets um, and you know, clearly, again, where people had hoped to sell them at a price and they didn't achieve their price, and instead of an outright sale, they were recapped and there were partial sales at lower than expected numbers. So I think there's clear evidence of a pullback as far as uh, peak pricing. All right, so that's I, I think there's a difference yeah. uh, in the pricing pullback 
depending on the kind of assets. If you're dealing with a more opportunistic asset where you're betting on uh, releasing the property or a lot of vacancies, uh, filling it up, etc., cetera, uh, prices have come down, I think, because the buyers, like the people at this table, are more nervous about the economy and less certain about the growth over the last three or four months. A lot of talk about potential double dip, etc. That seemed to have calmed down a little over the last month, but the winds uh, change very quickly in this environment that we're in. We're in a very volatile world. On the other hand, if you're buying a, uh, a more of a core type asset, with a very good cash flow, with interest rates being virtually as low as they've ever been, um, pricing is probably uh, held more uh, because uh, if you're buying a fully leased building or some, for 10 years or something with good credit, and you you know it's you look at interest rates, uh, the 10-year bond is around 2% right now, uh, you know maybe 20, 30, 25 bips higher than at the very low. Um, so I, I think there's a difference. Uh, the, the, the real question that uh, Kukro has asked us, and he always asks tough questions, uh, do you think uh, the opportunities will be as good? And as I think I said earlier, the best opportunity was at, you know, buying general growth stock you know, in, two, in March of 2009. Uh, but everybody was uh, so frightened that the very few did, a few did, and they made a fortune. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, there are probably deep, very good opportunities to invest if you look at going forward over a long-term horizon because, as I said earlier, there's not a lot of new construction and you've got a tremendous amount of, uh, of debt coming due by the banks. You're going to see more and more uh, opportunities in that sense. And as uh, uh, John Gray said, you're still able to buy clearly way below uh, replacement costs or way below certainly uh, were assets traded in 06 and 07, not suggesting those were good pricing. Obviously they weren't, but you, you could buy stuff, you know, 50% or even less in some cases, but not as cheap as maybe in uh, 09 and uh, early 10. Well, I guess that that's you know, exactly what I was getting at, Neil, is that real estate at the end of the day, you have to project out the future, the future cash flows. And for whatever reason, pricing pulled back. I think as Paul said, it, the evidence is clear. You know, the question is why. And I think, as Neil said, there a lot of it came back to fear that people toward the end of the summer, September, started getting really nervous again. And were maybe projecting that they weren't gonna grow rents at X percent for the next three years, and maybe things would be flatter. And will this present a good buying opportunity in 12? Because clearly people have dialed back their perception of, of growth um, for real estate, I think, um, going forward. Well, I, w I would add, um, sorry, Kelvin, no, I, I will, I will uh, just say that I think what's creating the opportunities today Kooks is more about the distress and the problems that are in the system from 05, 07. I would echo Neil's comments that you just have a lot of troubled assets in the system. So uh, if you look, I think the 05, 07 vintage CMBS, it was about 600 billion originated, and today about 40% of that is either on a watch list, delinquency, foreclosure, you name it. If you look at the European banks, I think the numbers are even bigger in terms of what needs to work its way through the system. I think that's what's creating the opportunity. I happen to think um, that the fundamentals are a little better than most people recognize. Um, yes, people were scared over the summer, but if you just look at the data, it's still pretty good. It's not as a result of strong economic performance as we know, it's because of this complete lack of new supply. So in our office portfolio, we've seen vacancies decline by 450 basis points this year. We've seen our hotel portfolio run rev pars of six to eight percent. Uh, we own a piece of general growth, which we bought out of bankruptcy, although we didn't buy for penny, pennies on the dollar. We did very well with it. General growth announced earnings, I think, last week, and same-store sales were up 8%. So I think the underlying fundamentals are very good, uh, a reflection, again, of a lack of new supply, not robust growth. But the opportunities are not going to come because of 
in my opinion, because fundamentals are getting really bad, it's because we just have a lot of troubled assets around the globe that are in the system that need to be worked through, and it takes time. It just doesn't happen overnight. It's like flotation device below the water. Somehow they will surface. You don't know when, but the next couple of years, I think, will continue to be pretty busy on that front. I think that's what, and we'll get other people's thoughts, but I think what you're saying, what the panel seems to be saying, is that the fundamentals you know, the fear that crept in may not have been justified. The fundamentals actually are looking still pretty strong. There's going to be a lot of opportunities where capital is necessary to recapitalize. So maybe 12 and 13 could be very good years to invest. John, if I could just add, I, I agree with uh, John's comments very much on the fundamentals. You look at, you know, re retail sales certainly is an indication of consumer activity. I think they just announced yesterday up half percent in October, the fifth straight monthly increase. People feeling now a bit more bullish coming into the holiday season, which is important. The consumer, as John suggests, is certainly, I think, uh, spending again. Uh, not, not enormously, but they, they feel, you know, 91% 90, of them are employed or us are employed and they are acting uh, sort of accordingly. On the other hand, I think that the major capital movements are being driven by risk aversion and yield, in my mind, if you just look at how, how money is moving around. And the REIT market's a great indication of that. If you look at you know, what's, what REITs are doing really well and how are they priced, and how is the REIT market compared to the S&P, it's outperformed the S&P dramatically, particularly since the, the downgrade of the United States credit rating in, in September. Initially, they came off together, and since the REIT market's come back much more strongly. I think rep represented the fact that people are looking for yield in safety in the, in the, in the, uh, in the alternatives to 2% 10-year treasuries. Um, but that's taking capital to a certain kind of real estate asset. It's assets that are obviously fully leased in institutional quality in major U.S. markets. We, I think what we're all seeing is an enormous bifurcation between the demand for ca of that sort of capital and the sorts of real estate assets that it wants to attract itself to. And to Neil's point, if a building is under-leased or needs some additional construction or is exposed like hotels to more dramatic economic um, uh, cycles or, or activity, there is presented a whole different, I think, set of opportunities. And at least many of us up here, I think, are focused on those places where institutional capital that's satisfied with a 5% yield and a 2% treasury environment is not interested in going. And that's, that, that, has, that requires you to sort of parse through the market and find those opportunities. But, given the level of refinancing that Bill talked about that's still coming down the pike here, our sense is there'll be significant opportunities in the next couple of years, aggravated by the fact that you have in Europe a very dramatic unfolding situation that likely constrains credit and uses an awful lot of capital um, to solve those uh, very fundamental problems. That'll ultimately transmit itself to the United States in some fashion and probably in the form of tighter credit generally in this market. I think one other thing, John, I think you touched on it before, and I think it's really critical, is we talked about being able to buy assets at significantly below replacement cost today. I think when we're focusing on fundamentals and we're really focusing on leasing and where rates are, if you really look at the major supply constrained markets, from the peak and when you really look at 07, rents probably fell on a net effective basis, if people want to be honest, to probably about 50% in a lot of these markets. And we had some strong recovery in 2010, strong recovery in the first half of 2011. In a few of the markets, we were probably up you know, 10 to 15% in 2010, and another 10 to 15% for the first half of this year. And I think what's caused part of the pullback is people now are just expecting, given the global uncertainty, you know, election year and the issues we have going on in Washington, that we're going to take a pause again on rental growth. And clearly that's one of the things that allows people to step up and really pay for an asset is what their expectations are of future rental growth. And I think what's happening now is it's not that the fundamentals are softening. I think it's slowing a little. And I think in the short term, when you look at all the assets that have to be recapitalized, there'll be opportunities. But long term, you look at where vacancy rates are, which are still relatively healthy after the last two years, and you look at the lack of new supply, I think when the market does stabilize, we really get through the, the crisis we have going on globally and in Europe, we get through our elections here, I think you'll be poised, whether it's you know, two years out, you know, 18 months out, I'm not sure, but we should be poised for some strong rental growth. And so it's just taking a little longer than we had all expected a year ago. I, I would agree that fundamentals are better, but I think you have to ask uh, compared to what. Um, when you go back as far as 1980, credit to GDP in this country was 150 percent. 
it's gotten as high as 375 percent. We have serious fiscal issues at every level of government, municipal, state, federal. And if we're really going to deal with these issues, um, we're going to have muted, stifled, constrained growth for a while. And so, you know, I think tailwinds in the past have all probably made this look smarter than we are. I think going forward, we're going to have a headwind. And I think it's our view that, you know, if there's growth, that's, that's great, but we're going to have to make our money at the real estate level. Maybe I'll, and you guys beat me up on this if you want, but I'll make a bullish statement that, um, you know, it's sort of the chicken and the egg. Being in real estate all my life, I think real estate drives our economy. And so do you need the economy to get going first or do you need real estate to get going first? I think real estate has to get going. And what I've seen um, for the going back three years or so, not much, many of us did things because things were over leveraged and the system wasn't allowing them to get recapped and no money was getting spent. I was talking to uh, John Hardy out in the audience um, now a large portfolio of uh, uh, Staybridge Suites were recapped, two-star products, 83 communities around the country, 10,000 rooms. They're going to renovate all those rooms. You add it all up, it's the equivalent of, of building another MGM, you know, huge hotel in Vegas. John, you have this, you restructured Hilton debt. This hotel is now wrapped. Rumors are $500 million, $400 million to renovate this thing. It's going to be spent. Little old Northwood. We have about a $300 million construction budget on assets that would have never had a penny spent on them unless we were able to restructure them. And it takes about a year to 18 months to get these projects going. So I feel in all the stuff that we've done, when you add it all up and other people have done in the audience, that just now, sort of just as we're sitting here today, the money's starting to be spent, the jobs are being created, and that, that's going to happen for the next 24 months to, to take care of that lag of 08, 09, 010 when, when nobody was renovating. So I think you're going to see a lot of jobs created in the real estate business um, just working on the assets that we've all restructured. I guess nobody agrees. Well, <laughs> you know, Neil, you built a casino, created 400 jobs there. I mean, it's happening, right? 5,000 jobs. 5,000. We built four casinos since the Great Recession, and, we've, and these are permanent jobs, plus 5,000 construction jobs. And actually, uh, the revenue of those, these are regional casinos, not Las Vegas cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. Our, our uh, win, which is our revenue, basically, is up uh, probably 15% of year to year. Uh, so, we have somewhat of a, I've been in business a long time, I'm sort of the old father of this group here. That's a compliment to you guys, I wish <laughs> I were your age. But the, the reality is, I have never seen um, so much disagreement about what's happening uh, in the world. You've got all this bearishness uh, on one side. Uh, and at the same time, business is not as bad as all of the fear about Europe, uh, go, the double dip. We have a bifurcated economy. Unemployment for the college, edu if you have a college degree, is 4.2 percent. Uh, retail sales at Saks Fifth Avenue are pretty darn good compared to, you know, a, a Walmart. So, um, unfortunately, um, those who are struggling and are unemployed have it very, very tough, uh, and, uh, but others are doing much better. So the business is not as bad across the board. You can ask manufacturers, retailers, if they're hitting certain segments of the economy. Uh, so it's very sort of uncertain environment. Uh, at some point, uh, I'm optimistic, uh, I don't never bet against the U.S. in all the years I've been in business and at some point we'll pull out of this and when we do I think real estate will do fantastically well uh, because what you're buying today is cheap and there's not any new stuff being built. If I can just add, I think what you're seeing is is a more resilient um, consumer among the 91 percent of the people who are employed in my view. 
And that consumer activity is, is, is quite bifurcated, exactly as Neil said. We, we own Neiman Marcus and Bergdorf Goodman here in New York. Bergdorf Goodman is going to have the best year it's ever had in history in 2011. Uh, Neiman Marcus, uh, same store sales are up 7 8% as a 6th Fifth Avenue. It's not, just, it's not just about our firm. On the other hand, at the, at the lower end stores, those that offer real value to their customers, the dollar stores, you know, Family Dollar and Dollar General and Costco, who obviously offers great value, those stores are doing great also. If you're in the middle, if you're Sears, you're not doing so well. Sears has negative comp store sales and has for a long time. Uh, the Gap is struggling with an unclear value proposition um, to its consumers. So there's a real bifurcation in that consumer activity who are becoming much more educated as pricing has become much more transparent, largely due to the internet and other sorts of things. But to the jobs point, John, I, I do think there are, there are development activities going on, the, the, this, this hotel and otherwise we're all, we, we build some, we're building a couple casinos in Ohio ourselves. Um, and there is sporadic activity in that regard. There is still a home building business. It's a third of what it used to be, but there's still a home building business. There are, there are jobs out there, but if you look at the 8.6 million jobs that were lost between the peak of 2006 and the, the decline of the recession, roughly half of them are estimated to have come from real estate or real estate related businesses in general. And uh, housing was of course an enormous part of that. You're not seeing any particular recovery in housing volume so far. And if you, if you look across the broader economy, it's, it's, it's sad every day to pick up the paper and realize that you know, Northrop Grumman just laid off 4,500 people, Novartis just laid off 2,000 people, uh, the post office laid off 7,000 people, and, you know, and you, go, you go through this. That takes a lot of jobs. So, but, but isn't that the, the sort of the point is that commercial real estate is now clearing, money's getting spent. Um, residential hasn't been allowed to clear. So if you have a house and you don't think it's going to increase in value or you have negative equity, you know, if it's your house, you're not going to hire a guy to do a new kitchen. If it's, you know, somebody else's house, they're not going to go to Home Depot and sweat all weekend putting in a new floor. So until, I guess I'm optimistic that the commercial real estate seems to have hit bottom and we're all investing and making money. I don't think that's happened in residential um, pricing yet. Uh, be, and we can all argue why, but it's, it, it hasn't. Clearly, you're right. I mean, the, the housing market, um, I think we think is sort of skating along the bottom. People have seen what, what, roughly 450,000 home starts a year. The average for the last 50 years was 1.5 million. So a third of the 50 year average of home starts. Um, that can't go on forever. You know, household formations are still probably something like a million household formations a year. Obviously a major swing to multifamily, which people on the panel here benefited from. And those assets have remained very strong. But the, the housing market clearly has not yet seen a recovery, although candidly we believe it will over, over the next several years. I guess I would just add that it's very difficult. I don't think any of us can discern what the economic picture is going to be. I think um, it's fair to say that um, you can debate it, but there are some serious headwinds, and so growth, I think, is challenged. The real question as investors is can you buy assets at attractive prices? I do think, to Neil's point, it's a bifurcated world. Distressed assets, broken assets, over-leveraged assets are a lot cheaper. And it's really about the entry price. So um, John and I did a deal in 2001, right after 9-11. We bought a business called Homestead Studio Suites, which was a moderate price extended stay business. And it was right after 9-11. And we went on to have 28 months in a row of negative same store sales. And you might have said, wow, that should be a really bad investment. In fact, that turned out to be the best investment we ever made. We made seven and a half times our invested capital. And the reason why was it was right after 9-11 and people expected 28 years in a row of negative same store sales. So the question isn't, is the economic environment going to be challenging, but is, it's really whether the asset you're buying today, the price you're buying, reflects a pretty difficult world. I think as it relates to distressed commercial real estate, it does today. Um, and I think you don't need to believe a lot in terms of a robust recovery. And if people have questions, I think I just got the sign. We're down to our last uh, 10 minutes or so. So if people have questions, um, stand up and I'll, I'll try to um, get to you. But, you know, so I, I guess for the panel, um, going forward, you have capital. You're looking to invest. Um, have you, are you changing what you're going to look at? Um, in 2012 or will it be the same type of situations in, as in 10 or 11? I know, Kelvin, you're growing your business substantially, you know, hiring a great team, 
Uh, do you think you'll be looking more across the world, more in the U.S.? How, how will that change going forward? Well, I think um, we will uh, continue to look at opportunities here in the United States. As I said, I think uh, there are lots of places that capital is not flowing to uh, aggressively where we think there are underlying opportunities. But it's much more about the, the micro market and micro, micro asset assessment. I think John is, is, of course, exactly right. There is an, a macro overlay which you can debate the exact nuances of, but it's probably not robust recovery. So you're going to be assuming some level, presumably, of, of modest overall macro market improvement. That would be our base case scenario. But the investments you make are going to be driven much more by the specific cities you're investing in, the specific product types you're investing in, and the, you know, and the deal often born out of some sense of distress that is presented by that specific opportunity. That's certainly how we're approaching the U.S. market. And we remain, at our core, contrarian in our investment philosophy. It's why we've invested in, in, a, in a big U.S. home builder um, in, the last, in the last six months. I also think the European opportunities are going to be very significant. And the, the, there have been some, I'm sure, very good European deals done, but one would have to think that the best European deals have not been done yet. Uh, the level of financial distress in Europe is increasing enormously. It's going to increase enormously. The scale of the deleveraging that has to happen there makes what we've done here look modest. Um, and in that process, there will be an enormous set of opportunities that become available to those, I think, even with higher cost of capital like us, who are willing to try to understand local market, local economies, and, and, and understand local market risk. So uh, we're quite optimistic about the realm of opportunities available to us, but it'll be both here and in Europe. And in Europe, in fact, you may see the best opportunities. Are, as you're looking at uncertainty in the economy, are you changing the way you capitalize transactions nowadays? Different debt structures or typical opportunistic buy something, get the most leverage you can, floating I I rate three years? I think on our side, the way we, we really were looking at deals in 2009, 2010 is the same way we're looking at them now. I think you're really going to be looking for, as John has said, the right entry point. You're looking to come in at a good basis, significantly below replacement cost. You're looking at rents today, as I was saying earlier, have come down dramatically, maybe 50 percent from the peak. And even if they've recovered 20 or 30 percent, it's still well below where we expect rents will reach uh, when the market recovers. Um, so I think from our standpoint, lower leverage to weather the storm and the uncertainty, longer hold periods. But I think if you have capital, you have sustainability because you have lower leverage and you buy an asset at the right entry point, if you have that staying power, you're going to get to the point where the markets recover. And if you look back at the prior cycles, rents in a recovery have always outstripped the previous highs. So I'm not telling you it's going to happen in the next two or three years, but whether it's three or five years out, rents again will have some robust recovery in rents, which will be great from a value standpoint. So you just got to be a little more patient um, as far as the hold period on the assets. On, on the leverage point, pro historically we've probably been about 65 percent levered. <clears throat> right now we're probably about 40 percent levered. Uh, that's probably lower than where we'll end up, but I think it does reflect our caution. With, with regard to how we're going to approach the business, we're going to keep on keeping on uh, very, uh, maybe more conservative than ever. We are pulling back on our international right now. Uh, you know, historically it's been about 35, 40 percent of our business. Uh, it'll probably be less than 20 going forward. Um, I would agree with Kelvin that Europe holds great prospects. Um, however, I don't think they're near term. I think we need some sort of resolution there before um, it, it, we should get aggressive. So the question is with the huge deficit that we have out there that should lead to a reduction in jobs and are people taking that into account on their future cash flows for real estate that they're buying? Well, the the big job creation we all need is obviously out of the private sector. I think there's been an, ex an enormous expansion, obviously, of pub public sector spending in the last couple of years. I think now 25 percent of GDP is the government sector, which is perhaps an all-time high other than the world during World <laughs> War II. Um, and that's inevitably going to come down, to your point. It's got to. Um, you're seeing already, of course, public sector jobs being reduced. I think in the last quarter, um, public sector jobs came down by 20 or 30,000 and private sector jobs expanded by something like 100,000. That trend is going to continue for a long time, in my view. You, you clearly have the public sector and government 
um, being a drag on GDP growth in, for the for the, at least in my mind for the foreseeable future because government expenditures really have to come down. There may be interim stimulus that uh, Secretary Geithner was talking about just yesterday, I think. So you may continue to see some spikiness in government expenditures, but over time, the trend has got to be downward, and that will draw down public sector jobs. I think what you're hearing from many of us is some confidence that the private sector will slowly eke its way out of some recovery here. Uh, 100,000 jobs, by the way, is not enough to make much of a dent. Uh, we're trying to make up for eight, 8 million. But um, I think over time, the public sector will overcome even the drag presented by a declining public sector, which is probably inevitable given our budget situation. Yeah, I would just add again that um, you have to believe uh, weak growth, I think, as an investor, given the headwinds out there. But once again, we, it's supply and demand as you think about it as a commercial real estate investor. And so if you think about a market like Atlanta, for 15 years in the office market there, they added four and a half plus million square feet of space. They're building no buildings this year. There'll be nothing delivered in 12, nothing thir in 13. And so um, if you ended up with an environment where economic growth was one and a half percent, but you had no new supply, versus economic growth of 3% and you had 25 or 3% new supply, this is actually net a little bit better environment. So if you can enter assets at favorable prices and we continue with an environment of absolutely no new supply, I think even with really tough headwinds that we acknowledge, you could still do, I think, very well as a real estate investor. That question is um, comments on the industrial sector um, going forward. You want me to do it? Okay. That's sure. <laughs> we own uh, about 50 million square feet of industrial today. Um, and as a result, we, I think we have a pretty good look into the market. Um, the market clearly has bottomed. There's, a, once again, same statistic, lack of new supply. I think the 10-year national average is about 1.7% new supply. Uh, this year, it's going to be something like 10 basis points. Uh, as a result, vacancy is starting to head down. Rents really haven't started to pick up yet, except in some of the best coastal markets, California, New Jersey a little bit, South Florida. Um, but our forecast would be the same, which is with a lack of, of supply and, and economic growth, uh, we'll start to see some improvement. And even in the middle of the country, at some point, we think rents will go up. So there, the support, again, is not robust economic growth. It's the lack of new supply that should support the industrial sector. Question is with where the Treasury, long term Treasury, historically opportunistic investors have been shooting for 20% plus returns. Um, is that still what people are shooting for given the low interest rate environment? I, I would argue it's probably easier today to make 20% returns in the last you know, year, 18 months, than uh, been seemingly going forward than you know, maybe the five or six years prior to that. Um, I mean, picking up on a theme that others have mentioned, you know, today it's all about basis, being able to impact the outcome uh, through the asset itself. I alluded earlier to a hotel we had bought in Boston. We underwrote it, taking three and a half million dollars of expenses out in two years. We're almost at seven million of expenses we've taken out. So even in a more stifled growth environment, which we believe is going to be the case, if you can get in at a good basis based on or compared to replacement costs and true economic value and have some levers you can pull on both the expense and revenue side, you know, we, we all should be okay. And again, if you're in liquid markets, as I mentioned at the outset. I would add just a couple things to that. Clearly, the properties that you bought over the last year and a half or so have done extremely well. And it sounds like everybody at this table was smart enough and had the guts or foresight to, you know, start investing at the right time. Um, going forward, if you look at the slower growth and you're more nervous and you run your numbers, you know, you're probably budgeting uh, a, a lower return than you did uh, uh, at other times. But I have to tell you something else. All right, what you forecast in your return is not doesn't necessarily have much to do with what your ultimate return is going to be. If you were buying at 06 and 07 and assuming growth kept going, you were showing a pretty high return. 
The bottom line is, is that the real returns when you look back are the highest when you invest near the bottom or on the way back. Uh, and that your returns are lousy when you're investing at the top. Now, the, <laughs> nobody can pick the bottom and the top all the time. Uh, but it's quite clear that we are not at the top unless you think we're moving into uh, the Great Depression. And uh, I don't think we are. I don't even think we're going to have a double dip. I think we're going to mess through this. Um, and kick the can down the, the ball or can down the field to some extent. My gut is you're not going to get a very good result in the next two weeks uh, from this uh, super committee. Uh, you're going to get no legislation to speak of until the end of the, uh, until the election uh, in November of next year. Uh, but the economy, as I said earlier, isn't as bad as some say. And this is a fairly cheap time to buy real estate, and there's no new supply. What about, we, we have a number of students in the audience. What advice do you give to people who are just deciding, okay, I'm going to start on a career in real estate? May we'll start with Neil, because you've been giving us, all of us, training and advice for a long time. Well, uh, follows from what I've just said, that I think this is a good time to go into real estate because you're coming in you know, near, the, uh, near the bottom on, a, on, on the start of a nice recovery. There's no new construction, so uh, at some point there will be, uh, especially in Atlanta, John. <laughs> I, I, I might say that while your statistics are brilliant, as you know, uh, when they start building, Atlanta doesn't have many impediments to new construction, and I've never made any money in Atlanta to speak of. Uh, I'd rather stay in New York, and I think you got more in New York than you do in Atlanta. But this is a, a very good time to uh, go into the real estate industry, uh, because I think it's uh, on a way to recovery. You're coming in early. It's probably a good time to start getting into the single family uh, home business. You're really coming in at the absolute bottom, and at some point that's got to change. All right. Thank you very much. Hope you all enjoyed it.